Street. Well, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, uh, Tuesday night edition. Tonight is Decision Making in Glaucoma from Panakan Deve, an OD PhD. He is a professor uh, of uh, optometry at Western University's uh, University College of Optometry in Pomona, California. He's the Director of Clinical Research uh, at that university. I've known Panakin for a number of years. I've always been impressed by his clinical, practical glaucoma knowledge, as well as his didactic research knowledge. He really is one of the sharpest minds that we have uh, in glaucoma care and glaucoma education. So I'm really looking forward to this. I think it's our great pleasure and your great pleasure to to see and and hear Dr. Panakan Deve as he talks about decision making in glaucoma. Panakan, please take it away. The, the the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. I think um, I am grateful to both Greg and uh, Dr. Sauka for this invite. Um, I see that some people cannot see the poll. So, Greg, you are on the duty, sir, to yep. make sure that they can see the poll, if at all necessary. And uh, it is indeed my pleasure. And I am extremely excited about this. The first reason is you never have these many people with their video cameras on in any Zoom that we actually give. So I am, you guys need to be uh, incredibly social individuals, which is fantastic because having video cameras on I don't feel like I'm lecturing to a monitor. I'm lecturing to real doctors and real human beings uh, that rather than actually a screen, which is what I feel most of the time when I give these Zoom lectures. So this is as close as to interactive sessions can be. So I'm grateful for the video cameras. Uh, please keep them on and that will really help, I think. All right. This is a continuing education lecture and these are my relevant disclosures. I've had uh, research support from... Um, almost all these companies. And also I may have actually lectured or served as a consultant where they get to pick my brain. If the research dollars are given, they are to my university, not to me. And um, uh, I do not claim that this is, uh, um, yeah, the, this was Vanessa's request. Make sure that we don't claim anything better or any, any superiority, et cetera. All right. We have... Of course, the pandemic taught us many things about the terms of pandemic, endemic, uh, and epidemic situations. So glaucoma is definitely endemic now in our, in our world. It's there. Uh, almost every single population in the, or a state or a country uh, in the world has glaucoma population. Now, we can, be, we can look at national, uh, uh, international statistics, but you know, more close to home, we have about 3 million cases of glaucoma and about four and a half percent of people over the age group of 40 tend to have ocular hypertension. Now, we all know that a significant portion of these people, about 50 percent, if you leave it run about 20 years or so, could get into glaucoma, but a lot of them don't. Uh, so you'll have to make a decision where you treat or don't treat. And when you just look at the nerve and say, what is suspicious? you really have four times more number of patients than compared to just glaucoma patients. So we have about 3 million or so, arguably 50% undiagnosed. Uh, you add on top of that 4.5% over the age 40, and you look at suspicious nerve, this number gets larger, larger, and larger. And by the year 2040 worldwide, we'd have about 100 million individuals uh, with glaucoma. And what medical stats has taught us is we tend to beat these statistics uh, which nothing to be proud about, but we tend to beat almost all statistics that we have, diabetes, diabetic retinopathy. And in that case, we might even actually beat uh, statistics of blindness due to glaucoma, which is a scary concept. At, at, at any rate, uh, if you all are glaucoma physicians, you better, you better hope that when your patient passes away, their nerves look more like this section in uh, histology rather than this section that you're seeing. So the one to the right is actually a cupped out nerve due to glaucoma. You really want the patient to retain all their a reasonable amount of retinal ganglion cell axons so they don't actually um, become blind. 
So we have a condition that is 50% underdiagnosed, and you have a condition that is also arguably the most overdiagnosed disease in clinics. And you, know, you may ask, how can it be both? How can it be both underdiagnosed and overdiagnosed? Well, the problem is that the people that really need an eye exam and have glaucoma, they just don't come in for an eye exam until really late. And the people that actually come into the clinic due to either uh, various uh, conditions or just by fear of potentially being glaucoma or not. I've had friends use sentence that nobody ever got sued for actually treating. Not very right, not, not very nice thing to say because you know if you're not sure that it's not glaucoma, what are you treating? Are you treating emotions or are you treating really the disease state? So it is actually one of the most overdiagnosed disease. And in some way, uh, it is in part because uh, uh, doctors are uncomfortable with looking at the nerve and saying that, uh, no, it's not progressing, I can wait, or they are just pulling the trigger too quickly. So it is an overdiagnosed condition and an underdiagnosed condition. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of diagnosis, we have to acknowledge that intraocular pressure is not helpful in diagnosis. We know that we have normal tension glaucoma, we have ocular hypertensive, we have normal tension glaucoma, the patients, their pressures uh, during measurements don't reach statistical limits of normality. So they stay less than that and yet glaucoma. And the flip side is you have ocular hypertensive patients that have elevated pressure and no identifiable damage yet. But if you put that away, and say diagnosis, not very helpful. Treatment, progression, risk factor, et cetera. It is the most important risk factor because whether you like it or not, the pharmaceutical industry and the NIH trials have all concentrated on one thing, IOP. And if you alter lower IOP successfully enough, then your progression is lesser. Your risk in terms of glaucoma decreases because you lower the pressure. And it's the only alterable risk factor, not that others are not potential or not really potential, but because others have not been rigorously tested. So for example, blood pressure might be a huge parameter, but can we actually alter the blood pressure, improve perfusion pressure in a more systematic fashion that patients actually don't progress? The answer is no to that question. Is it not important? The answer is absolutely not. It is important, but it's not alterable in meaningful, scientifically controlled fashion without risking the patient's life. If the heart stops ticking, the eyeball will stop working, guaranteed. So we need the heart to keep ticking. So when we start messing around with complicated parameters like heart rate and blood pressure, we could be in trouble very, 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 very fast. Now, 2008 was the first time that the World Glaucoma uh, Association put out a consensus series on IOP, and two tonometers were considered to be better than Goldman. One is ocular response analyzer, and the other is the uh, dynamic contour tonometer. Dynamic contour tonometer has fallen off the favored list, and I don't think it's being sold around in the US, but European countries, they still use it. So I'll talk only about the one that we have commonly available, the ocular response analyzer. Now, if you're using ocular response analyzer, which I'm hoping you are, it's just a non-contact tonometer, and we'll talk about its working principles, but the corneal hysteresis or corneal compensated IOP is the most fascinating of the two parameters. They give you other things as well, resistance factor. It can even actually have a picometer attached depending on which version you have, but we have the IOPG, which is the Goldman correlated IOP, IOPCC, which is a corneal compensated, which is the least affected of corneal parameters, and corneal hysteresis, which is a kind of a bending property, uh, a, a, a viscoelastic property of the cornea. I'm using the generic term bending, but it's a little more complicated than that. Viscoelasticity uh, is a, 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 uh, a property of any substance that it actually deforms on the basis of how quickly and how um, at what level of force is applied. So not only how much force, but also how quickly the force is applied. So if you look at ocular response analyzer, in its fundamental nature, it's just a non-contact tonometer. Um, you have a infrared emitter and you have an infrared detector. And the infrared emitter uh, reflects off of the cornea, which is a uh, con uh, convex uh, surface. 
and it reflects away. So you don't have a very high signal until you get a perfect appellation. So if you get perfect appellation, you get a peak signal. And then uh, any viscoelastic substance will not stop exactly where you actually pushed. It will go further down because the energy is transmitted and becomes concave and you find the signal going worse. And then you have what goes in has to come out. So the cornea will finally come out due to the pressure being pushed from inside. And you have a second appellation. And then eventually uh, the, the measurement stops. And what it has shown is there's the difference between appellation pressure one and appellation pressure two is the uh, viscoelastic property. Now, this has been shown by numerous smaller studies that it probably has uh, uh, a real role to play in perhaps progression detection and risk for glaucoma, but uh, I am yet to get convinced on that parameter. I like the idea of it, but when you actually have normal ranges that are so wide, how do you know that the person has glaucoma on the basis of this value? Can't. When you go into progression, because of the normal range being so wide and the variability in the measurement, I don't think it can be that helpful for individual patients clinically. And yet I tell you that you should buy one of these devices when you get a chance because if it's IOPCC, which is a corneal compensated IOP, is the most uh, accurate of IOPs that you can get. And it doesn't get influenced by, influenced by corneal parameters. Now you might say that I usually use these IOP values as a starting point. And if I lower by three millimeters of mercury, then, then that's gonna be fine. It'll stay exactly three. The problem with the scenario is multifold. When you lower IOP by three millimeters, and if the relationship of IOP lowering and the measurement error is linear, which essentially means that the error stays same at 20 as the same as 15, as the same as 22 or 25, then that's fine. You can actually manage for that kind of an error. You cannot manage for an error that is non-linear, where depending on the pressure of the eye and you know, I can talk your year off about this if you really want to, but I don't think you want me to talk so much uh, two hours on just IOP dynamics. The point is the error is not straight line. It could be any, any shape. And what we understand is that the error not being linear, you can't just correct for it. You just can't say, all right, I lowered by three. It went down to by from 20 to a 17. I'm good. Well, actually your 20 may not be a 20 and your 17 may not be 17 itself. And that can... And the difference drop may not be three itself. And when that kind of a scenario is there, you may have a real problem with the situation. So this is an option, non-contact chronometer. But then you could go into something, let's say something more simpler that you could perhaps consider tomorrow. Again, I have no conflicts of interest in both these topics. It is just science to me. And the corneal, uh, the CAT chronometer, which is, uh, which is in, which is given by Reichert or sold by Reichert, mm -hmm. is basically... You take the Goldman probe out and you put a new probe, which is the CATS, which is correction of appellination tonometry surface. Pretty interesting term name, CATS. And what they found is that having a curved surface uh, displaces the forces towards the periphery and the central cornea is a little more independent of its rigidity in loosely explaining. However, because dynamic contact tonometer has the same kind of curved surface, there was a very good chance that this was going to work as well. And it did. Because what, he, what here uh, um, Dr. McCafferty has shown is that compared to uh, manometry, and when you do manometry in the eye, you get the real pressure in the, inside the eye. It's as close to real that you can get. This CAT tonometer IOP is less influenced by corneal parameters when compared to Goldman, and it's certainly an easy transition to make. It's a little trickier to perform with this CAT tonometer, but nothing that a, practice, a seasoned practitioner cannot learn in about 20 to 30 attempts. All right, so let's bring the first polling question. And the first polling question is, what disinfectic technique do you like as your, as your choice? Um, perhaps 60 seconds is more than enough, right, Greg? To close the poll whenever you want. Yeah, I got a watch on here, you know, already, uh... Uh, sixty percent of the people have uh, have already replied. So, they're a very seasoned group, Panakin. Um, and uh, well, there's really nothing that has rolled into the uh, chat box yet regarding questions. And um, the handout I launched at eight twenty one. So, and I think I did as well. So it's a, it's the same thing. So you're good. 
Yes, Panak, and when uh, you know you ask an opinion question, that comes in pretty quick. You ask a factual question like this, comes in pretty quick. You ask a part two NBO uh, board question, takes a little bit longer. Well, and you know, I, the good news is I don't think optometrists that have graduated and licensed need to take boards again. So I think this question is a little more exciting. So um, hydrogen peroxide, bleach, and at least 6% said glutaraldehyde. So glutaraldehyde, um, the, the current uh, standard, and again, it's all arguable because there's no real standard. Hydrogen peroxide system or bleach are the two systems that are most popular. Uh, both these techniques you've got to watch out for because bleach can leave a pretty nasty burn. Hydrogen peroxide can leave a pretty nasty burn. And alcohol can leave a pretty nasty burn if it's not led to air dry. And glutaraldehyde can also leave a pretty nasty burn if you don't dilute it to 2%. Because if you get a full-fledged 100% glutaraldehyde, and I've seen one case where a lazy technician just filled it up with a full-on glutaraldehyde. And of course, you know, that at that percentage, you can give a real chemical burn. So it's a nasty uh, uh, op thing to do. Everybody likes alcohol. It's easy. It dries up pretty quick. Uh, I would say that if you let it air dry, that's ideal because alcohol needs at least one minute to completely do its action, whatever it can do. I'm not going to say that it actually kills all the bugs. I, uh, bleach uh, is probably the closest to removing almost everything except prions, which is a mad cow disease that none of these can actually work. So hopefully I pondered enough on the question, moving along. All right, so now we go into- and Actually, and actually somebody came up with a, a different option that I think we we never consider is disposable. Uh, actually it's coming up, uh, Joe. Okay. So you hang your, uh, hold your horses. It will be it'll be also discussed. So let's go with that. So COVID consideration freaked everybody out except the Florida people, never actually freaked them out for anything. So. Uh, we all, everybody in the con and the uncle got freaked out about COVID and said, all right, can we use non-contact tonometer? It causes aerosolization of tears. What could you do about the situation? And yeah, the reality is that, yes, there can be aerosolization if you had frank epiphora. So if somebody is uh, crying their eyeballs out and the tears are rolling down the cheek, I would say don't do NCT. For everybody else, you are reasonably okay. And so these are the four studies. I'm not saying uh, any more studies have not come out, but these are the four studies that have looked at it. And basically the summary is aerosols can be produced. However, uh, not the kind of particulate matter that, that you know travels a lot. And depending on the IOP, which you can't know before you do the tonometry, it may not even be an issue. So basically, yes, aerosols are produced. If you are using a UV scrubber next to, which is pretty cheap, uh, $140 when I bought, I bet you it's now 70 bucks or less. You can buy a simple UV scrubber, leave that in key places around your office, certainly next to a non-contact tonometer. If you are wearing a N95, you are perfectly safe to go ahead and use non-contact tonometer. We've begun non-contact tonometry back on how to use. So 10% bleach, soak for five minutes, wash with water, and let it dry is effective against most microorganisms. It does not work against prions. And you could certainly consider disposable probes like the Hawkstrite has, which is a Goldman, or you could use a disposable probe, Cat's Prism probe, which is also now available. And so if you are, depending on what, which one you want, I'd say if this is the same cost as the uh, Hawkstrite disposable probes, then perhaps going for this one uh, would be a good idea. All right. So I uh, just came back from um, American Glaucoma Society where I made a presentation and you are um, the second group of people to hear this on intraocular pressure, telemetry, home tonometry, and in particularly contact lens device uh, that I'm working on in doing research. Part of the um, advantages of having so many continuing education hours is to also keep up with the latest things that is just round the corner. You don't want to go uh, talking about molecules that are probably never going to become a drug. But if you know that the drug is coming in the next one year, it's probably worth talking about. And I think this is something to definitely pay attention to. Now, we have various reasons for requiring home tonometry. You can scan a QR code. You should get a full PDF file related to it. Uh, if you want to read a little bit more. But the idea is that 24-hour measurements are never easy. And most people have actually, even European countries have gone away from it. But you think that you actually need it in certain cases like 
normal tension glaucoma, where there is chances of progression are very high or high risk of progression, or you're wondering if somebody's progressing despite your best care. If you're trying to assess the efficacy of drug A versus drug B in research situation, or if you're trying to choose a particular uh, efficacy of a drug, did it really do something better or just a fluctuation IOP, then you could consider uh, telemetry or perhaps con uh, nighttime measurement of IOP. Uh, and uh, certainly a technology that doesn't require us to get into a slit lamp, which is a very artificial position uh, that nobody sits around all day like this, right? Who, who, who really does that? It is, uh, so if you're in a more seated normal position, if your IOP can be measured, that's always a great idea. And continuous IOP monitoring is always the dream if we can accomplish. So um, with that in mind, there are so many options that have been tested. It's not a new concept. You know, it goes, you know, contact lens devices, implantable devices, all these have its advantages and disadvantages. So let's talk about how, when did all this begin with contact lenses? You know, it's well before I was born. And you actually see that, you know, this is not new at all. Uh, Gilman and Green looked at um, rigid lenses with a sensor in place. And what they did was basically try and get IOP values. Now, this is not very comfortable to the patient and you needed a wire, but the concept was appreciated. Subsequently, Cooper et al. has looked at scleral lenses. You know, everybody thinks scleral lenses are a new invention. They're not. They were even available in the 70s. They were just bloody uncomfortable. Uh, so people didn't use it. So you use a scleral uh, sh shaped lenses with actually pressure pushing device on it. And they looked at dogs and rabbits. And what they found was depending on the animal, it worked or it didn't work. So the rigidity was a problem. And then fast track, I... I kid you not, I have been very excited about this technology for a very long time. They just didn't give it to us in US. So it got FDA cleared. So there are studies that show that it may work, but it got FDA clearance also, but the sale of Triggerfish device never happened. And there were multiple problems to Triggerfish. I'm gonna start by explaining uh, the set of problems. And I don't know why it never made it to sell here in the US, but the problems are evident. So you have a sensor like this, and the sensor is attached, and then you require amplifying signal sensors around your face. And what the contact lens does is really doesn't measure IOP. What it really measures is change in peripheral curvature of the cornea. So you really needed the contact lens to be pretty tight, almost not movable, for it to truly measure the pressure, which gave all a bunch of problems subsequently, which any contact lens person would know what kind of problems would be of extremely tight lens. But forgetting those problems, it was not a direct measure of IOP. It wasn't like applination tonometry. So this was a real problem. It gave pressure units that were converted to millimeters of view. So no, sorry, curvature changes that was converted into pressure units that finally was converted to millimeters of mercury, which was too many steps involved. And they showed that, yes, you can actually follow or track pressures in, uh, in, in vitro experiments. Uh, when you use, you use a manometer and you change the pressure, you get good a good sort of concordance. The reality is that it was a great idea. It's non-invasive, it's not permanent, can be used on an ad hoc basis, uh, but there were many disadvantages. It's reproducibility was questioned, the surface tension, light exposure, temperature, all these are contact lens related issues. And the eye movement has a real problem on these measurements as well. Anyway, it got approved uh, and it never actually made it to the market. And I said, why not? And um, just the way it is. All right. So it's not available for sale. It did not pick up the nocturnal spike in pressure in about 63% only, actually they saw the nocturnal spike in pressure. They, most of the time the correlation was very, very weak, about 50% to Goldman values, and the spike of pressure was never seen. So I can kind of understand that they shelved it and they didn't think it will make a, make a big splash in the US. So comes the, the presentation that I wanted to give you, just brief, on contact lens IOP monitoring system. It's cutting edge science, but bear with me. It has just been presented at American Glaucoma Society in, Aux in Austin, Texas. And I thought this is a good uh, crowd to kind of give you an introduction to. My co-author was Professor Jim Seif, who was the president of New York Eye and Ear. And we wanted to see that the contact lens system can actually measure IOP in healthy first and then glaucoma patients second, and compare it to Goldman and Eye Care 200, which is, not the same as home tonometry, but it's it's better than home tonometry. So if it can measure Goldman and eye care, then it's you know it's, we are we are onto something. 
So how does this how does this do it? Basically, it's a contact lens that has. Um, don't think of it as one unit contact lens, but multiple layers of contact lenses. And there is a sensor layer, which is basically a very thin film that's extremely sensitive to pressure. You have silicone oil kind of material in the, in, in the reservoir. And you can see in this, in, this, in this patient, so there's a reservoir right there that has the fluid. And when the pressure increases, you can see, you will be able to see that the, right there, right there, there's a marking which says, what's the pressure value right now? And it, it, will, it will increase in its column when the pressure goes up. And when the pressure goes down, it'll go right back to the reservoir. So somebody can take a camera, take a picture of, a, of an eye and actually say what the pressure is. Now, we could easily put numbers on the contact lenses. There's a real reason why not put numbers on the IOP because you don't want your patients freaking out. Your patients and your technology wants to should alert the doctor but not freak a patient out. And so having alphabets freaks the patient out less whatever the pressure was, and the doctor can be alerted. So now that you understand the idea of this contact lens and the sensor, there is literally no electronic device in this. There's nothing electronic about this. It is old fashioned technology of pressure, like, like, a, like a garden thermometer, but it works great because less technology means that less things can go wrong in this measurement. And we looked at uh, 25 patients. We made sure that the right eye and left eye were very similar in pressure because we had it. We needed the control eye, and we used the soft contact lens system. We measured uh, IOP using Goldman and uh, rebound tonometer, which is iCare 200. We measured the pressure for uh, two hours, and then subsequently the patients were given astrozolomide 250 to bring the pressure down. And then you followed up for two more hour, uh, hours. Every half an hour, we measured again, and uh, we got the data for these patients. The um, the values of the of the uh, smart lens uh, my lens device correlates very nicely within plus or minus two millimeters of mercury in seventy eight percent of Goldman values, and uh, in 70% of rebound tonometry values. Now we know that both these tonometers are flawed to some extent. And so we will never know exactly what the ground truth inside the eye is, but clinically it gives you values that you can actually understand and use for your patients. And here's an example of a patient that you can see that, you know, baseline values and then how the pressure changes over time after 15 minutes. You can see how it nicely matches up with these with the with the various measurements that are taken in the fellow eye and the and the study eye, and you can see how after after a few hours when they given us tozolamide, how the pressure keeps going down and ends very nicely. So this my contact lens system is in good agreement with Goldman and rebound tonometer. We've only looked at four hours, but the next study will look at uh, perhaps uh, before the FDA trial, which should be in a few months. We will go up to 12 hours, and then of course the FDA trial will be 24 hours. Uh, we need larger trials. And of course, watch out the space. This should probably be published and hopefully the FDA trial will get completed in about a year or so. So here's the second poll question. So do you think a contact lens system that measures IOP about 16 hours a day, it doesn't measure, tw it doesn't measure 24 hours because when the contact lens is underneath the eyelid, because there are no sensors, you can't get a value. Uh, you have to wake up to measure the nighttime pressure. Uh, do you think a contact lens system that measures 16 hours a day would be useful to clinicians? Hey, Panak, and while the uh, question is rolling in, and maybe you'll get to hear, and if, and if you do, you can just pause if it's in your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, probably 50 to 60% of my practice is now glaucoma. And I have the ocular response analyzer. I have another mechanism coming in here soon that I'm going to try out another way of measuring. Obviously, I can do Goldman. I typically do Goldman, um, you know, when I do Ganeo, my once a year, numb the eye up, depending on the patient, maybe I'll do it twice a year, I'll fall back onto Aura. Do you feel that there are other acceptable ways to manage glaucoma and, and treat glaucoma and it doesn't have to be Goldman? Um. So ORA is better. Uh, or ocular response analyzer is a better tonometer and dynamic contour tonometer is better. Um, you can certainly use both these Appalachian uh, type tonometers to get your value. And I think they're better than Goldman. In fact, every glaucoma patient of mine definitely gets an ORA measurement because of the IOP uh, CC value. So right. yeah, I think if you're practicing with uh, ORA or uh, dynamic contour tonometer or 
perhaps the newly introduced uh, cat stonometer, you are practicing a better than what is considered the gold standard. Now, the irony is gold standard term has been thrown around for Goldman for too long. It's, right. it's gold standard because everybody, uh, most it's most commonly used tonometer. It's not gold standard because it is more accurate. And that's a problem that uh, uh, doctors would have to eventually uh, digest. And as they buy the new tonometer, consider alternative devices. Yeah. So I guess the, uh, the point here is, remember, most of these are kind of transcorneal type of IOP measurements, and they all are going to be flawed that's out there. Um, so I just, I just kind of want to just kind of feed into the discussion just a little bit, and then I'm going to end the poll. Okay, so that's fantastic. 75%, I mean, music to my ears, um, definitely. Um, I'll take a picture of this just because I think my research collaborators will love the idea that these many people thought was good. Um, it is not perfect. Um, 16 hours is not 24 hours. Uh, 24 hours will be ideal. But um, we will. what was known that out of office hour measurement, right? So if you're talking about eight to five, and then you talk five o'clock to perhaps 10 o'clock, you find a lot more people actually showing spikes outside the office hours, not necessarily always midnight or middle of the night, but out of office hour spikes are very, very notorious. Second uh, lesser known fact is that you have a lunchtime spike that most people don't talk about. After they eat their, their food, their, their, um, their metabolism sort of kicks into gear and they have a secondary production of aqueous humor that occurs at that time. Lesser known spike, but does happen. And the third thing is that no kind of regular pattern of IOP is followed in glaucoma patients. And so really 16 hours will get you a lot more data than you uh, probably would need. However, that is the bias in me uh, saying, so you will have to wait for unbiased use by clinicians and perhaps uh, take it from there. All right, moving along, sir. All right, blood pressure and glaucoma. And I, how far have I gotten? It feels like I'm talking forever. So 40 minutes or something gone? Yeah, you're- How okay, about no. that? All right, so blood pressure and glaucoma, the highly underestimated uh, problem because we are so enamored on IOP that we forget about something so obvious. Now it's been told, we've learned in glaucoma lectures that you know blood flow is a problem. We don't have good measuring devices to measure the blood flow. And it's, it's even if we measure overall blood flow of the eye, what we really need is capillary blood flow, which is very variable. And uh, the number of capillaries can be variable between human beings. For example, we are all homo sapiens, but not the number, same number of capillaries or tributaries from the major blood vessel actually come out. So blood flow is complex, is a big understatement of the century. Now, having said that, blood pressure is something we all measure, and then we you ignore it. And so I'm here to show in the next five slides or six slides why it could be very, very crucial and something that is worth of your uh, 60 seconds attention or discussion with your patient. So low diastolic blood pressure or low mean ocular perfusion pressure or low diastolic perfusion pressure. I can go through all these how to measure in a minute, but all these are independent risk factors to glaucoma, not, not, not related to IOP. And if that means that statistically after accounting for IOP, these are independent risk factors. I'm not saying that you need to measure blood pressure on every patient like this, but at least in any patient that you are concerned about the blood pressure being an issue, be hypertensive patient, stroke patient, or perhaps glaucoma patient, you may consider measuring. The, you know, this is the guideline from Institute of Cardiology. You measure, you get the patient, come in, sit down for about five minutes. Then you measure blood pressure twice, five minutes apart. So you measure once, you measure again, five minutes later. If the systolic blood pressure was actually 10 millimeters of mercury different between the two values, or the diastolic blood pressure is five millimeters of mercury between the two values, then you really have to measure the third time. And then of the three values that you took, average the two closest values, and that gives you your systolic and your diastolic blood pressure. From that, you can actually calculate diastolic perfusion pressure, which is a very easy equation. 
Dastic perfusion pressure is equal to dastic blood pressure minus IOP. Now, this easy, easy equation had been shown by almost 30 years ago um, or longer uh, by uh, Tielsch that if you have a low perfusion pressure, your prevalence to glaucoma increases, low diastolic perfusion pressure. The problem with this equation is it's too simple and it doesn't account for the systolic component of your blood pressure. So if you can actually take the, you know, you've got your handout, you can plug this equation into an Excel file so you don't have to memorize this and then just plug in the number of IOP and the blood pressure and you get a, aha, you get your mean ocular perfusion pressure. Now, in the next three slides, I'm going to show you examples why this becomes important. So you start with, as the intraocular pressure increases and the blood pressure decreases, you find the perfusion pressure goes down. So as the IOP goes up, blood pressure goes down, the perfusion pressure goes down. That's a real problem. However, let's take normal ranges of IOP. You take pressures of 18, 16, 14, and 12, and let's take the 12 number. You might say 12 is a pretty solid, good IOP and that should, patient should not have a problem. But when you go down in, this, in the x-axis and say, what's the blood pressure? Depending on the blood pressure values, their perfusion pressure could be pretty low. Now, you don't see too many people walking around with 100 over 60, but it is not that uncommon as that you think. If you actually looked at you, some of your patients that are post-heart uh, um, attack, uh, you would find that you know patients are on extreme medications. These are common occurrences in those cases. Now, so the perfusion pressure and IOP are two, two things that may increase your risk for glaucoma. And they actually go hand in hand. And depending on where, where they meet, that's your risk of glaucoma. Now, I'm not saying intracranial pressure is not important, but then it becomes a very complex graph to actually draw. All right. So if you think of intracranial pressure, put that away for a few minutes. Just let's think about simple things that we can measure right now. We can measure diastolic perfusion pressure or perfusion pressure. We can measure IOP. And it's an equation that actually, you know, the risk increases as any of these two increases. To drive the summary uh, point across, greater the IOP and lower the blood pressure, that's a really bad combination. Nobody disagrees. But in terms of perfusion pressure, Pressure, intraocular pressure of 12 with 100 over 60 is at the same risk as 26 millimeters of mercury with a blood pressure of 120 over 80. Now, ponder on that. You would, you would probably worry a lot about this 26 millimeters of mercury patient, but you may conveniently not even worry about the patient that was 12 that had lower blood pressure. Now, I agree, 100 over 60 is a little low, but that's... That's the kind of dynamic that you see. And when you start, once you start paying attention, you will see many cases of these. And the cases that I actually see, like for example, one jaw dropping experience I want to share is somebody's nerve was not making sense. The pressures were low. I looked at their blood pressure uh, dynamic and I found that the per perfusion pressure was really low, but it was still not making sense. And then I said, so, okay, I wrote a letter to the PCP. They did some more blood work and they actually caught a real cardiac problem because of this attention to detail. So if you watch out for this combination, it will probably uh, pay huge dividends uh, for your patient care. All right, um, good. Any questions at this point? Uh, I understand pressure spikes at night. So how would 16 hours really be helpful? I think I answered that Dr. Walters, but let's, let me try that one more time. So ideally 24 hours will be most ideal, um, but uh, when in the absence of 24 hours, because you need electronics and uh, also the 20 in the nighttime pressure has even more bigger problems because how your eye gets pressed on the pillow, uh, how you turn, toss and turn, those can influence the values a lot. I, and I agree, 24 hours is better than 16 hours. However, the, the peak pressure in glaucoma is not written in stone. It can be any time of the during the day. And if the patient can keep awake for 16 hours, you get 16 hours of pressure measurement. And the other eight hours, um, you don't. But right now, we don't have technology to necessarily make sure that happens. Now that you asked the question, Dr. Walters, I'm going to throw in one more extra thing. So trigger fish didn't work. There comes goldfish, a funny name, right? But that's what they're going to come with next called goldfish. And what they are doing is they basically took the sensor out of the dynamic contour tonometer 
They put that sensor into the contact lens, and now that is going to perhaps give better IOP measurements. When that happens, great. Until then, uh, until then, perhaps other things have to be considered. And Panak, and just so you know that uh, you, that question came in right before you explained everything, but it was good ah, to hear it again. So, but anyway, it's no harm. Uh, Repetition is good sometimes, and you know you it can, is, and it's always good to be challenged. You know, I always like. I, I mean, that's the scientist in me loves challenging theories. We may challenge and almost be at neck, almost at each other's neck, but then we actually walk out of the room and then we buy each other beer because that's how science should be. It should not be about any egos. And uh, we should be willing to be challenged on any of our preconceived biases. Okay. Let's talk about advances in perimetry. We, I mean, about time, we need some advances because the whole 24-2 uh, has stayed, stayed, its, stayed in its place for such a long time as the gold standard that we need new, new visual field testing strategies. Uh, and there are many things that we could have talked. I wanna talk about the Humphrey, which is the most common uh, um, update there is, and then, or most commonly used visual field device, talk about their update. There's Octopus as well, which has its own beautiful algorithms, and very few, not probably less than 20% of the country uses it. And then there are other devices as well. So we'll talk about uh, Humphrey, new, new parametry, and if you have any Octopus-related question, feel free to ask, and we can talk about it. So Don Hood has been on this K on this issue a lot. And he has shown systematically with various experiments that if you don't have the macula points being measured, then you don't catch all the damage in glaucoma. Simply put, if OCT shows ganglion cell complex damage, one is likely to show visual feel with macular damage. And yet we don't show as much. And the reason might be because of the flawed pattern of 24-2, rather than actually that the macular damage doesn't occur in glaucoma. All right, so here are some examples that learned from him, saying that 24-2, you know, if you have some damage, then you can see how much damage do you see in 10-2. Here's a patient that doesn't have any damage related to 24-2, but some damage present in 10-2. And then here you have patients that don't have damage in the, in the central region of 24-2, and that shows that there is no damage on 10-2. So it can, it can go both ways. Now, if you did a 24-2 and a 10-2, it'll take a lot of time. So what they did was they looked at 10-2 patterns, and then they said, well, can we find some hot points? Can we look at some regions that are most going to give the best bang for our buck? So this is not a publication. This is a consensus group meeting by uh, four people, uh, at least one of them that's an optometrist, Dr. Flanagan. The other individuals are 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 not at least not not uh, not optometrist uh, to my knowledge. Right here in this region, right here, um, uh, Dr. McKendrick is is the optometrist, and the other ones are not. All right. So now you go into a ten dash two pattern, and they said, well, let's actually sprinkle those points in the twenty four dash two. But if you did a twenty four dash two, see the standard and then you sprinkle extra points on it, a test that almost takes on glaucoma patients six to eight minutes, you put extra points and you did full, and you did CETA, it's not full threshold, it's CETA standard. It becomes ridiculously long test. So they had to alter the parameter of how they were testing. And they convert, they produced a new test called CETA faster. So CETA faster 24-2C, all right? So, if you actually looked at the number of patients that actually have, so this is a, and I'll come to the free software in a minute, but here you have 24-2 uh, C, uh, CEDA faster. So this protocol, the, the, how, the, how did they ever manage to cut time was by removing the reliability indices. Fixation losses are not measured. So they put zero out of zero, but that really should be not measured. Then you find false positive, which is actually not, not calculated. Neither is false negative calculated, yeah. all right? So none of these uh, reliability indices are measured. And you can actually tell whether the patient has really did the test better or not on the base of gaze tracking. Now, the gaze tracking, more publications are out. I, I don't want to make this only about research papers, but the gaze tracking is really not not uh, appropriate, it doesn't really appropriately work with the fixation losses, false positives. 
Um, and you can clearly see this is a lone slide uh, from Zeiss. And you can see how many, how many 10 degree movements patients can have had. So that's a, all 10 degree, the big lines are all 10 degree fixation losses. That's a lot of fixation losses that can occur. And you have no way of knowing whether this is a reliable field or not. And what, what they're saying is that if you did a 24-2 and you don't find any damage, if you did a 24-2C, C to faster, then you might find all this macular damage. Good an idea, really, really short test. And here are some more examples from them as well. Now let's try and assess the problem with the situation. You have about three minutes or so to do 52 plus 10 points or 62 points or so to assess the threshold in three minutes, when, which means that you have less than, less than three seconds for one point. How can you truly calculate threshold that quickly? So I, I leave you with an idea saying that 24-2C is a too fast a protocol and given the issues related to its reliability may not be clinically useful. It's a free upgrade by Humphrey. So if you have a Humphrey 3, they'll give you one. It has more macular points, which is good. However, the faster is has thresholds within plus or minus three decibels, gives you some macular information. And their recommendation is if you give, uh, you find a macular damage, you still will have to do a 10-2 in the patient. So you'll end up actually spending more time doing uh, more testing uh, subsequently uh, when you land up with this protocol. So 24-2 uh, still remains the protocol that I utilize in clinic and for the reasons that I just explained. Now, virtual reality parameters are cropping up everywhere. It can't be like, you know, there are only, there are, there are, there are at least five to six ones that I know of that are cropping up. And they all don't have the necessarily data back, backing as they should, except one that has actually published. So I'm presenting this data, but don't take it any more than that this, this device has some data. The other devices need to show you this kind of data. Okay, and I'll give you my eventual conclusion as to where I think it is. So would it, would it be amazing to have a virtual reality perimeter that your patient can do some testing in the waiting room whilst actually uh, waiting to see you. Not a bad idea at all. I love the concept. They have some level of artificial intelligence uh, talking to the patient uh, and telling the patient to do the study, do the test. Nice idea, good. And this is the only paper that have, they have published, but there are other ones that are coming out on pediatrics and then more longer studies are needed. So this is the first attempt to showing its correlation against Humphrey. And they do correlate with Humphrey. So Humphrey uh, mean sensitivity against age, you can see the same kind of trend line as the visual all perimeter, virtual reality perimeter with trend. So it's similar. If you look at Altman and Bland plot, which are the agreement statistics. So let me explain agreement versus correlation. Agreement would mean that the two techniques are giving you usable same kind of data. Correlation would mean that they are, they are agreeing with each other, but they may be off by a certain amount. So agreement is a better form of testing when you look at technology and one device versus another, versus correlation is useful when you are actually not sure that they're going to correlate, but if they are parallel, then you can actually easily make one very similar to the other. All right, so agreement testing is ideal. And you can look at this in uh, x-axis, they have the mean of the data, and y-axis, they have difference between Humphrey and uh, visual all mean sensitivities. And you can see that the zero bias line is here. And their overall, their data was within plus or minus two decibels in normals. In the glaucoma patients, they are plus or minus five decibels in the normals, um, with majority of them actually being within two, uh, two millimeters, sorry, not two millimeters, two uh, uh, decibels uh, plus or minus. So this is not a bad start. We need more research like this to show that it actually works. And in fact, it does diagnose glaucoma pretty accurately uh, in this small sample study done by Will's Eye Institute. But never get too impressed by the place that the study comes from. Always assess the data. And if, uh, this is done by Will's Eye and great job, Dr. Katz and, uh, and et al. But uh, you know, um, never get impressed by just the location of the study. 
and their and their grayscales are matching reasonably well. There are some examples. It'd be nice to do have a perimeter for pediatrics, although we seldom need this in pediatric population. Uh, it can probably do some form of color vision testing, and it can also do a little oh, bit more. My. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Every so often, someone comes off because it's meetings. We locate it's them quickly. Per you just it's keep perfectly moving. fine. Perfectly. Fine. <laughs> so I, they, they said hi. So I said hello in return. <laughs> so um, all right. Uh, so the question, the the point is that yes, we have. Uh, it's nice if the parameter has a few extra testing. And my next that goes right into my poll question. Um, Do you believe that the virtual reality perimeter is the future wave or not? And here are my choices. This is some opinion answer. So uh, polling, a question came in not related to really much other than PAC imagery here. It says, I check all patients with PAC, you know, PAC imagery uh, if they have glaucoma, if they're a glaucoma suspect to give an idea what the true IOP is. What are your thoughts? So, um, Dr. Chem, um, so the picometry or picometry uh, that you do is actually an estimate of the corneal uh, thickness. Uh, it is telling you that if it's a thick cornea, you have a chances of overestimating the IOP. And if you have a thin cornea, you have a chances of underestimating the IOP. And I have spent a solid 15 years plus on this topic and found that there is no easy way we can correct the we can get the true IOP for the population, but we can't get individual true IOPs accurately. So it's clinically not very helpful. Let me explain this. So thick corneas, you overestimate IOP, but you could have a thicker cornea that has edema where you underestimate IOP. Now, thin corneas, you underestimate IOP, but let's say you have a precaritoconus or a form fuchs, uh, fuchs uh, um, form fuchs, or, uh, yeah. So basically, a subclinical keratoconus, and when form, you actually have form, form frost, from frost, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. you're right, correct. From frost, you can say how many times I say that word, right, around in my office. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, right. so the sub, so, so subclinical form of keratoconus, you are highly underestimating pressure. So uh, thickness is a proxy for error, but it doesn't really give you a true value. I have shown this in 2005, where Ehlers uh, equation doesn't work. And that was published in Journal of Glaucoma. I still find it problematic that the EHRs use Ehlers equation. And uh, so it'll be very wrong. Um, so basically, don't correct your IOP. Uh, just try and get a more accurate IOP tonometer. Uh, so, so Panak and Joe, Joe knows that this is my soapbox. And I'm just going to kind of echo and just kind of maybe say it a little different ways is, you know, don't adjust the IOP up or down based upon the cornea thickness. And then just use it as a risk factor. We do know that thicker corneas decrease risk and thinner corneas increase risk. Don't introduce human error to the already flawed measurements for intraocular pressure because they're all transcornea that are out there that mm -hmm. Panakin talked about earlier. Just don't adjust up or down. Correct. A, a question came in. So just pause for I'm a second there. Um, no, no, no. It. There's one. Nope. There's one that came to me direct. Okay. So it says, please give some discussion on FDT frequency doubling technology matrix. Do you have any opinion yeah. on that? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, frequency doubling technology was exciting, um, claiming to be magnocellular testing device. If you looked at the primer written by, um, is in, published by the company, you would find my name in the third author position of that FDD technology. I was the third author to write the, so uh, Chris Johnson was the first author and there's another person in between. And then I was the third author. We were all very excited about the perimeter, but it turned out to be quite a, quite a disappointment overall because uh, it probably doesn't really test Magno cells. And, uh, and it's really, uh, the nail in the coffin was, when Zeiss wrote in its own primer that there is data suggesting that short wavelength automated parametry or frequency doubling technology is not going to diagnose progression any sooner than compared to white on white parameter and citing Hans Leme's work in the, in the field. 
and I know Hans LeMay quite well because we've published together. And I am, so being the author of the primer, I can tell you I never use it. And I have, we were all excited about it. And it's really turned out to be a disappointment. So that's my opinion on that matter. Now, uh, jumping into, is it the wave of the future? 60% of the people, I like, I like this answer too. I want to just take a picture of this. Um, okay. So 60%, yes, that'll be ideal given flexibility. No, that's a fad, 13%. Definitely, if it can do more than just fields, which is good. And then depends if I can sell my current device, which is the more practical problem to the issue, right? Because you have a device that sits around and then until somebody can buy that, uh, you can't really change. So uh, we, uh, in our office, we have uh, all the devices. We have Octopus, we have Humphrey because it's a university. We have the uh, virtual reality parameter as well, not the visual all device, which was not my decision. The neuro decided to purchase a device. And um, that's what we have. So before okay. going on, you still have yes. you know, the question that you could probably see from Michael there, Michael Tran, that says, how is yeah. the sensitivity and specificity? Um, did, did you go over that one or did I miss that one? Sure. So no, I did not go through that one. Thank you for <laughs> pointing me that out. So Dr. Tran, it looks like from that paper, if you just go back a couple of slides, what you will see is that sensitivity and specificity and, and particularly ROC, because what you want to see is how many correctly did you identify uh, the, the, uh, the ROC curve was better than Humphrey in its diagnosis for the virtual reality perimeter. Now, again, please hold your conclusions on the matter. Uh, I, really, you know, this was a small sample study published by one group from one center, uh, good center, good people, but one, one location. And so I, I would like to see more data come out and make sure you question whichever device you choose, make sure they show you real data, publications, not just a white paper. All right, don't go anywhere because a direct message came to me. It says, could you please repeat IOP and corneal edema? I think that's about the adjustment. So. Sure. So the corneal um, thickness increases uh, when you have edema. But when you have, there are two kinds of edema. You have intracellular edema and you have extracellular edema. So let me tell you about extracellular, which is the more frank edema that you see in the cornea, right? You see the edema, the corneal swollen, right? And what happens is the water has come out between the stromal fibers and the cornea is thickened, but it becomes a, it becomes a, it becomes a very soft cornea. So it's a thickened cornea. You can measure with the chemeter and you will say, well, it's a thick cornea. It should be overestimating IOP, but actually opposite is true. It underestimates IOP because it becomes a very soft, squishy cornea. Think of like, you know, pushing on a balloon. The pressure inside a balloon might be, um, pretty high, but it's easy to squeeze, right? Because it's thin, it is, uh, it is flexible material. That's how the edematous cornea is. Now let's talk about intracellular edema, which is the edema that we don't notice. So we all know from Optometry 101 that if we have 8% edema, then we have actually changes that the cornea will show. You have less than 8% edema, the cornea will not show any changes that a slit lamp can actually identify. Who, which patient would have that? Any contact lens user that you just popped off a contact lens and you measured IOP, you're, they have probably some level of residual edema that you have not actually accounted for. And in those patients, the cornea becomes stiffer because the water is still intracellular and it is not out. And so when that happens, it becomes a more, calm, more, more stiffer tissue. So thickness is a proxy for error in IOP. However, thickness is not the whole, the whole thing. You could have a thicker cornea, but softer cornea. The biomechanics of the cornea, which we cannot actually measure, uh, is, is a real problem. And if at all, um, we have um, another attempt, I can bring in more uh, fine examples on this area that can nail this topic down. So some of the time. You got right. you got to thank you. You got to thank you uh, for that explanation. Please, grateful. Okay, so how do I correlate structure and function and why should I, or is it really not as correlated as people want you to believe, right? So structure and function. Now let's start with the summary and then I will go through the whole shebang. Structure and function should 
not be polar opposites in glaucoma. If they are polar opposites, look further. They may not agree 100%, but they should not be polar opposites of each other. With that in mind, how do I correlate structure function and what can I do clinically today to have impactful outcome for my clinic patient tomorrow? Let's start with, there are many graphs I could have chosen. I've chosen Felipe Medeiros' work to only, only show, because he, they show the retinal ganglion cell count rather than microns, uh, um, rather than linear, nonlinear curves, et cetera. So let's think in terms of early glaucoma. So here you have uh, average thickness in OCT, um, where you have patients' average thickness. And then you have a mean deviation uh, in, on, the, on the other side of y-axis, where you have decibel plot. And then you have retinal ganglion cell axon. So in early glaucoma, we all seem to agree that structural loss precedes functional loss, meaning that you will see structural damage, but you may not see functional damage until a sub point, some point where the damage becomes obvious in functional loss as well. Now, in this, functional loss is equated to visual fields. There are various other functional techniques but this is just visual fields. Now, when you see the tail end of glaucoma, you find that OCT is not able to measure below 45 to 40 microns, arguably 45 microns. And you still see functional damage or functional visual field can still measure something. So OCT is not capable of doing a good value at advanced glaucoma. Visual fields seem to be having a problem in early glaucoma, but overall in the middle range, they are nice and parallel which means that they are measuring the one and same thing and they actually are just disassoci disassociated by a certain distance. So uh, you find that the structure and function should correlate for majority of the cases, except early versus advanced kind of glaucoma. Whether structure always precedes function is a whole different question on its own. For example, we assume that structural damage occurs first because the cells have to die and the cells have to die so the visual field or vision loss occurs. But we don't really measure individual cells. We measure gross thickness. We are never measuring individual cells thickness in our clinic. So if the device is not capable of measuring individual cells, an OCT doesn't have to be any more accurate than actually visual field, but we are somehow more comfortable with OCT than other, other functional measurements. So another topic for another day, whether structure comes first or function comes uh, first. All right, but let's assume that structure comes first. And if you want to correlate your visual fields with the uh, disc analysis or nerve fiber layer, here is Garve Heath's uh, TED. Uh, that's also a good publisher, uh, published author. And I have published uh, at least four or five papers with him. Um, and what, what, what he has shown, and this is very old work, but it's very useful still to date because you can just take your vis Humphrey visual field and say, this location correlates to this particular nerve fiber rare region that I'm talking about. And so you can put this plot on your wall and do a little mental math quickly enough uh, that you can, uh, that is certainly possible. Now you can also do other forms of structure function correlation and staging of the disease. And if, for example, let's talk about staging the disease. If the, if the person doesn't have a lot of cataract, then one could use a mean deviation as a simple metric. But we do know that cataract affects uh, visual fields. And so that might not always be the case, but assuming that is not significant, early, early damage is less than six decibels, moderate damage is between six decibels and 12, and the severe damage is 12 decibels. So this is only looking at one part of visual field. There's a lot more to it. So here's another one by a dear friend, Paolo Brusini in Italy. Uh, Professor Brusini showed that we can use mean deviation and pattern standard deviation in a combined metric to actually stage the glaucoma. And this will be very helpful because if you can use both mean deviation that doesn't account for uh, cataract related uh, loss, uh, and here this is pattern standard deviation, which is accounted for cataract related loss, all you have to do is print this slide out and match your mean deviation to pattern standard deviation. And you take, and let's take the example of seven decibel loss on pattern standard deviation. You have seven decibel loss, uh, and then let's say you have 
um, about eight decibel loss on your mean deviation. So where does seven and eight meet? Right there. So that would be stage three in glaucoma, right? And so you can have, you can have depending on where the mean deviation and pattern channel deviation meets, you can actually stage your glaucoma patient. And why is this important? Because one size fits all will never work. And depending on what stage your patient is, you're going to alter what treatment you do for your patient. You might choose to start with prostaglandins, or you might choose to do something else entirely on the patient. So this is a, a this is also freely available, um, uh, and uh, you may please take a printout of this or ask me, and I'll give you a bigger slide if needed. Some other points to remember in terms of uh, field testing, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't, it's all about explanation, explanation, explanation. If you don't explain the test well to your patient, they will not do correctly. If you are not calibrating the device correctly, you will not get good values as well. So start thinking in terms of issues that you can fix. Patient, you can't fix. Patient is patient, right? Now, if you turn on your device in a brightly lum uh, illuminated light, uh, then the calibration is wrong and your decibels will be off by about one to two dB at the very least. I have done this to show that you have two decibel uh, differences that you will find. Second thing is, if you don't patch the fellow eye well enough, when you're testing my right eye and if you don't patch it good enough, the, non, the, the eye that you're not be seeing creeps through and I can see and uh, the blind spot monitoring is off. So patching the eye appropriately is very, very crucial. Pupils need to be at least three millimeters, but more important to be consistent in what you do. So if you dilate, dilate all the time. If you are actually not going to dilate, don't dilate. But consistency is very, very crucial. If your pupil is less than three millimeters, I have also done that experiment to show that you will, lo you will start losing uh, uh, your uh, visual field pretty fast when it starts going down to two millimeters. Or if you have a three millimeter and with cataract, you're going to have losses nevertheless. So if you have cataract, my best, uh, best guess is please dilate everybody fully as much as you want. Mask will definitely fog the patient's lens. If you mask the patient, which you should if you're using a Humphrey visual field because it blows air out. Octopus does not blow air out of the bowl. Um, and if you have a, if have a, have a FDT-like device or perhaps um, an enclosed device, which is fully enclosed, there doesn't blow air, that's fine, you're good. But if it's blowing air out, you can actually cause uh, infection to spread. So make sure you tape on the top part. Otherwise, you'll be getting weird visual field defects and chasing your tail. You need a break. People will tell you they're okay, but you need a break. So every two minutes, um, it's worth actually just pausing the test and asking the patient, are you okay or do you need a break? The chances are the patient will say, I am okay, continue please. And then that 10 seconds of discussion is sufficiently enough to get the monotony broken and they do perform better results in their testing. Um, we don't have technicians in our clinic. We have to do all the tests ourselves. Uh, so it's either the doctors or the students. And so having done many, 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 more than how many I care to admit, I can tell you that this, this trick will work. Anytime you have dermatochelasis or ptosis, ptosis we all tape, dermatochelasis also has an effect. So tape the eyelid and again, lubricate when you get that two minute break point. If your lens is too close to the eye, that will cause the patient to tilt their head back and that will give you bad results. If the lens is too further away, you will get bad results because you will get ring scotomas. And depending on if the lens is further away, but the patient's slightly tilted, you will have a nice arcuate scotoma. Try it. You'll get a nice arcuate scotoma trying to chase your tail as to how come I, this arcuate scotoma is not making sense. It'll be reliable. So you want the lens holder to be close to the eye, but not touching the eyelashes uh, and make sure you do, it doesn't fog up. There are many things I can tell you about lens holders. I do not use the, um, the uh, liquid lens because astigmatic error greater than diopter has serious impact on the, on the visual field. So all these are points that you can consider. And above all, the reason I put the Troxler phenomenon uh, picture on the right is that if you have a plus, if you look at this plus sign, and if you're looking with your one eye closed, you will see all these pink dots disappear if you are staring at the plus sign. And the reason of this is Troxler phenomenon. 
And this is really uh, an important point for visual field because you're asking the patient to stare at the central dot and they will see darkening in the periphery. If they blink, then they actually don't have a problem. But the patient's trying to concentrate so much for visual field, they don't blink as much. You just told the patient that they could have a potentially blinding disease that you want to evaluate for. You send them away to visual fields. They see their vision creeping out, creeping up, becoming dark in the periphery. Patients really freak out on these things. And patients are not educated uh, uh, individuals necessarily that they will that they understand the whole disease process. And so make sure you tell the patient to blink uh, uh, regularly. The best time to blink is when you push the button because you will never get a target shown to you when you're pushing the button. All right, any questions, please keep them coming. All right, let's move on to omidenipag isopropyl 0.002%, Omlanti uh, that was uh, FDA cleared in September, 2022. Um, now, I'm sure some of you have heard there is a doubt when this drug will be released, if the drug will be released. We don't know, but we do know it is FDA cleared. And why is, what is it going to do and how is it better or the same as prostaglandin uh, analogs that are available right now? That's what I will be discussing. So omidenipag isopropyl is the, the, the drug compound. It's a prodrug. So the active compound, which is omidenipag, is is created by hydrolysis to esterases in the cornea. Something very similar to what we know about prostaglandin. Prostaglandin, latanoprost, is converted to latanoprost acid by corneal esterases. So these corneal esterases also work on omidenipag isopropyl to convert it to omidenipag, which is its active compound. They are highly selective EP2 receptor drugs, and the EP2 receptors are found in various locations of the body, including the eye, and within the eye in multiple, multiple locations. But the if you understand beta blockers, you will understand this, that if you control G protein activity and particularly cyclic AMP production, you can control aqueous humor uh, production and to some extent also the outflow. So you have the, um, the, the increases in G protein activity and cyclic AMP in ciliary body, as well as trabecular meshwork. Both these happen, and to influence the outflow, both in the trabecular meshwork pathway, as well as the uveoscleral pathway. I know Greg's given some lecture on omidenipag, so love your comments on it as well. So in, you don't have a direct way of measuring uh, uveoscleral pathway. The only way you can actually measure uveoscleral pathway is by fluorophotometry. So what you do is you measure the total outflow of the eye, right? You subtract the trabecular meshwork outflow, and then you get the uveoscleral outflow. So uveoscleral is a calculated entity, and omlanti or omidenipag seem to decrease both the trabecular outflow as well as the uveoscleral outflow. Now, EP2 receptors are present in various parts of the body, brain, spinal cord, and the eye. And in the eye, in particular, where you have the G uh, protein uh, coupled receptor, uh, is expressed in the cornea, conjunctiva, trabecular meshwork, and ciliary body. And we're interested in trabecular meshwork and ciliary body because that those are the two outflow pathways that we can talk about. There are six outflow pathways to the eye, um, some which we so uh, we understand so limited that we only talk about two outflow pathways. And IOP decreases by both conventional, which is trabecular meshwork, and unconventional pathway. And they use uh, a non-inferiority study to latanoprost, which is much higher bar. Because at the moment, FDA does not even need you to show non-inferiority to latanoprost. You can just show non-inferiority to timolol and get FDA cleared. But they chose a higher standard, and that's good. That's what more drug companies should do. And they are non-inferior to latanoprost. So then if it's non-inferior to latanoprost and it works as good as latanoprost, why bother? Well, it can be because of the trabecular meshwork pathway and uveoscleral together, prostaglandin analog FP2 alpha latanoprost is only uh, mainly going to decrease the uveoscleral pathway. Because this drug can also influence the trabecular meshwork pathway, it is certainly worth it. And you can combine this too with various agents like alpha-2 adrenergic, beta blockers, rokinase, and its half-life is very much very, very small, just like 
uh, just like prostaglandin. Prostaglandin's half-life is about 17 minutes. This has about 30 minutes half-life and about four hours, it's undetectable from the serum. All right, so this has been approved in Japan for a while, 2018. It's been approved in Taiwan and Korea for a while. It's approved in um, US 2022, September, and we are still waiting for the drug to arrive. Now your guess is as good as, good as mine as to why this has not arrived. Um, but it has not arrived. So then why is this so good? Well, we know of the side effects that F2-alpha has. Hyperemia, it's a common side effect. Every prostaglandin has it. The iris color change is a real problem. And a percentage of population does not get this uh, drug, prostaglandin, because the, the iris color change. Nobody seems to be worried about eyelash growth because it's great, keep growing. Uh, and of course, uh, if the fat around the uh, around the eyeball decreases, they have a more sunken eye appearance. So the iris color changes and the sunken appearances, those are two major things that potentially Omlanti can fix. It, it uh, still grows eyelashes, right? Uh, compared to Tafloprost, but lesser, lesser amount of eyelash growth, um, um, but subjective, et cetera, versus objective, people actually report finding it. Eyelid pigmentation, there is a lesser eyelid pigmentation. Um, in, in terms of Omlanti. And there is a chance that because the FP2 alpha uh, shows iris changes, EP2 may not show iris color changes, which is another, another added bonus if that happens. So lesser side effects, potentially iris color change will not happen. Potentially the deepening of upper eyelid sulcus should be lesser, at least in objective formats. Um, this might be a, uh, a worth it. So opening up to uh, discussion and poll number four. Um, you can read this as well as I can. What percentage of patients do you think avoid prostaglandins uh, or doctors that you might avoid it because of the side effects that you have? Panak, and I think it might be worth, you know, we're, we're talking about this molecule and how it works on the prostaglandin receptor, but this is really not a prostaglandin analog. Um, so you might want to maybe, you know, we just touch on that real quick. I think that's the confusing part with this molecule is that it's working on the receptor, but it's not an analog. So, um, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, and again, I'll tell you, I'm mean, full, full disclosure. If it actually, um, uh, if it actually is on four legs, runs real fast, looks like a horse. I'm not going to think it's a zebra. I'm going to think it's a, it's actually a horse. So I talked to the lead scientist, the Japanese physician that uh, Akiro, uh, um, uh, uh, that actually did the work, and he could not explain to me why this cannot be considered a prostaglandin analog. I met him at the previous World Glaucoma Congress, and I, point Frank, put it to him, saying, tell me why it's not, because everything as it sounds, it actually sounds like an analog of prostaglandin. Why is it not? And so I... I have mixed feeling about it, and I would leave it at that. Okay. Well, I guess I'm just trying. Unless to you have try... uh, be, you have a more well, clear thought, then go for it. Well, no, it's just that the the side effects that I mean, I guess I was trying to say it works on different receptors. Correct. So the so receptor you... part, yes, I acknowledge. Yeah. yeah. So, so the e key so the is, EP2 is receptor that... may not have the same side effects as FP2 alpha receptor, but it it just is too much like prostaglandin with all the side effects, just a little bit lesser for it to be not be considered uh, yes. an analog. Now, maybe- So, so when I lecture chemist... with my pharmacist and uh, you know, we talk about immunology and how medications work, she has taught me over the years to learn about the receptors. You know, we kind of learned that with the alpha, uh, alpha agonists, why, you know, why Upneak does one thing and the other alpha agonists do another because it's all about the receptor. And I guess maybe I phrased it the wrong way, but it goes back to, um, you know, the key with this molecule is all about that receptor that it's hitting. And if you get hit with certain receptors, you don't get the side effects, but you do get the IOP lowering effect. Correct. So that I would agree. So EP2 is a different receptor. So the side effect profile might be different. Agreed. So okay. let's close this poll. And then it's not... It's a. It's not to do with the molecular structure, whether it's an analog. All right, someone replied that, and I'll share the results. Okay, so uh, a mixed bag, right? You think about twenty percent of them think that uh, 
Um, uh, Twenty percent of the patients, thirty-nine percent, majority of them, ten uh, percent may avoid uh, prostaglandins due to its side effects. All right, cool. Um, I, I just wanted to weigh. I wonder uh, how, how many of you, given well, again, the data is not clear whether the iris color will change or not. There is a mar indication that iris color may not change, and uh, periorbitopathy may not happen. But those are possible reasons why I might choose this over. Uh, the FP2 alpha receptor. Okay, so. Okay, got it. I think we answered that. There is how much blood flow dynamic versus IOP consideration, optic atrophy and or glaucoma, sleep apnea, hypotension during sleep night, beta blockers. Woo. Okay, so that's more like a, so the question is how much IOP consideration versus blood flow? At the moment, we can actually um, we can we can be pretty sure that almost all the drugs that we have in the clinic are only altering IOP. As a consequence of IOP, you may be altering a portion of the blood flow, but it's a secondary uh, it's a correlated secondary calculated metric. Everything else being equal, you really should choose the most the drug that lowers IOP the greatest because none of the drugs have either gotten on-label approval for neuroprotection, nor have they gotten on-label approval for blood flow-related protection. So everything given equal, you should choose a drug that gives the maximum lowering of IOP. Now, optic nerve atrophy, as you might understand in neuro cases, uh, versus glaucoma and or, given that glaucoma is nothing but a kind of optic neuropathy, you may often find that multiple uh, signs kind of overlap, and there is no limitation on the number of diseases a patient can have. And so uh, you might still have a person with glaucoma associated with vascular deficiency occurring in them at all. Sleep apnea and postural hypotension, as well as I think that's what you're talking about, um, and sleep, beta, uh, those are all issues that have shown correlation to normal tension glaucoma. And it is something that one needs to consider. The best estimate that I have about sleep apnea, if you don't have an overt diagnosis of sleep apnea, is when a person has a neck size of 17 inches or greater, then the chances are very high they have some form of sleep apnea, even if they're not diagnosed. Very high chances. So something to consider. Beta blockers can indeed lower blood pressure. So people have been avoiding beta blockers at nighttime. And most people that I ask take the beta blockers during the daytime. I have once pushed back on a doctor and sent a letter saying that their, their nerve is starving along with fundus photo. And the doctor, the PCB pulled off a, one medication. Now, I fully acknowledge that if the heart stops ticking, the eyeball stops working. However, the heart doctor is so bent on the heart-related issues that they actually forget the eyeball and the brain is actually starving. So what they do is they put in too many medications. It's not my role to tell them that, you know, decrease medication, but it's my role to let them know that the eyeball is starving. At that point, I consider my job kind of done in that issue. Hopefully I answered that question, Dr. Tran, and to your satisfaction. So moving along. Progression can and you glaucoma. See, can you see Jacqueline's uh, comment there regarding the uh, the molecule? Can you see her? Yeah, meaning? so, so uh, meaning is in the molecular structures defining feature is whether or not it's analog, just a thought. So it is a prostaglandin, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, prodrug. It, it, to me, it, uh, whether or not it's an analog or not mm -hmm. is, uh, is not as crucial as the receptor site and but I also doubt that the EP2 receptor, there is some basic biochemistry. I, I actually held back. I can, if you do the pharma lecture, I would give you everything about it. There are some EP receptors that are uh, that are increased, but also other EP2 receptors, other EP receptors, not just EP2, other EP receptors that might actually have very close, similar effect like FP alpha. That's why I am a little guarded in my, in my feeling that Omlanti is never going to have iris color changes or periorbitopathy, which requires long-term follow-up to show, just like many invasive implants have found that it looks really good in the first few years, 
and then they retract it subsequently. Let's talk even even the anti vegf you know, device that you know um, recently was introduced and then pulled back off the market. You know that can you can we can refillable anti vegf implant. You know, long term studies are very crucial. So I'm hoping FDA makes it a standard that yeah, we'll give you provisional approval, but we'll we'll reserve the full time approval until a later until a later date. So All right. now hold on a second before going on, because it came in private, just came in. Many of my male patients take ED medications. Some are pro, some are primary open angle glaucoma patients. Can the effect can that affect the perfusion slash IOP equation? Wow. It goes back 20 years when Joe Salka asked me to review a paper for then journal optometry. Can a, a nitric oxide kind of donating uh, molecule actually increase and be helpful rather than hurtful. Uh, you know, the doctor is asking, can it hurt in this case, right? So if at all anything, a Viagra does is temporarily increase the blood flow. So it can be helpful short term, but only for the short duration while the process is lasting, not much more than that. So you don't get a benefit. So don't start popping Viagra just because you have glaucoma, saying that I'm doing it for my glaucoma. Eh, it can get you a little bit of uh, blood flow, better effect, short term for 30 minutes or so whilst the process is lasting. But once the um, once the erection goes down, so has the other nitric oxide uh, benefits as well. And um, so I don't think it can hurt. I don't, uh, I don't think, believe it necessarily hurts, but there are some studies that say that maybe they are causing vision changes and color vision changes in particular. I, I really cannot uh, actually, I, they're not my case reports. So it's kind of hard to make a judgment on that. Um, but I, I think at the moment, there is no contraindication for Viagra that I know of related to glaucoma. Greg, Joe, any comments? Not anything to add to what you said. So just short acting mm -hmm. of it, it, you know, it, it increases in the, the perfusion, mm -hmm. but then it's short acting because of just the short nature of the, of the medication. I agree. Okay, brilliant. And Thanks then so Michael much. said, thank you. And Jacqueline says, very interesting and appreciate that explanation. So now, Panakin, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctors. The love, the lovely part of this is, A, I actually enjoy looking at your face first, everybody that actually shared camera. It doesn't feel like I'm lecturing to a screen. And second thing is, uh, Joe and Greg, you know, chiming in, it's uh, it's a real, a real asset. Now, everybody knows Greg is a world-famous glaucoma physician, and Joe is a fantastic neuro-ophthalmology uh, a neuro optometrist and glaucoma specialist. So it's good to call on these people uh, and ask their opinion as well. So thanks for that. All right. Yeah. So progression and glaucoma. If only we know exactly how, when, when a patient will progress the best way. So let me start with a joke. You know, what is the sure shot method that a patient never progresses in glaucoma? And I've had all kinds of people answer the question. I should have had that as a poll question uh, while I was not thinking Joe humor. But, um, you know, the sure shot way to never see progression is actually put a patient in a drug trial because every drug trial says that during the drug trial, the patient never progressed. And the reason they don't progress is not because the drug is wonderful and God's gift to earth. It's because they are so much called upon. Drugs are given for free. And every evening or weekend, somebody calls them, you're taking your drugs, aren't you? And, and you know, reemphasizing and holding their hands. That's why people don't have progression. So progression as per all NIH, NIH large-scale studies, seven years, 10 years, if at all, you know, you take care of the patient properly. And yet for clinical cases, we see progression in a couple of years. And that's because they, if the drop doesn't get into the eye, the patient's going to progress. That's all as simple as it gets. And of course, there are other factors like we don't know the peak, a spike in IOP, uh, et cetera. And so those are other, other reasons. Now, this calculator came 20 plus years ago. It's still worth it. And I want to talk about the calculator, but I want to talk more in terms of the 20-year follow-up data of ocular hypertension treatment study. So this calculator, you can use a QR code. Um, you can actually get a PDF file downloaded and plug in the ocular hypertension patient's numbers and it tells you a risk to conversion in the next five years, which we all are aware. If a patient has less than 5%, we monitor. If it's greater than 5%, then we could actually treat them or watch them. Oh, sorry, treat them or uh, watch them in that region. So 5% monitor, so less than 5% progression in five years, you're just going to monitor them. If you have 5 to 15%, could consider treatment, but don't have, it's not a must. 
greater than 15% really treat the patient. Now, I have, found, I have seen progressors that have 7% of conversion child risk progress in two years. And I've seen patients, uh, so it's, it's just a crapshoot at that point. So you really don't know and you have to discuss with them at, the, at that point. One ocular hypertension treatment study gave us with European glaucoma prevention study is that we can actually use a calculator and make some scientific, scientifically informed decision whether to treat or not. But we were always worried in the back of our mind, if we don't treat a patient and they progress and become glaucoma, will their progression rates be worse than the patients that were actually treated? Uh, right? So you have a patient that was treated and you're looking at their trends or how their progression curves are. Then you, there's another group that you waited and watched and then you treated. Will the progression curves be different in that group of people? So meaning that is delaying progression more, sorry, it's delaying treatment more harmful to the patient? And the answer is after 20 years and a very complex paper, I'm very, I'll be very happy to give you the publication, but I will tell you that it will confuse the dash out of you. May Gordon published the results. And the results are in summary, one line that you are okay to wait and watch. You are okay. Your progression is not going to be worse or you're not causing harm by waiting and watching. So use the calculator. If you wait and watch, you find a progression, subsequently treat, you are not going to be causing that patient severe damage or they're not going to go down the tubes really, really, really fast. That is a that is a 20 year outcome uh, of a lot of millions of dollars spent, which is very useful outcome, I would say. We use OCT all the time. Everybody does. Nobody can actually remove it from your hands. Not a single person in this audience will probably say, you can take my OCT, I don't need it. Or I'm looking to sell mine and get rid of it. Uh, no one's gonna, no one's gonna say. Full disclosure, almost all the F FDA trials of uh, all the major OCTs that are in the market came through my lab at some point or the other for either their pre-approvals, even before their FDA trial, even for their pre-approvals before, even by the analysis of the software, so I have my fingerprints on these devices all over. I feel they're all my babies. So I'm not going to criticize one device or the other. They're all my babies. And you need to understand limitations of each baby. Some baby is good at one thing. Other babies are good at other things. And so you've got to choose, make your own choice what these babies can do for you. So getting an OCT is not in question at all. Whether or not what you get from it is up to your clinical decision. Now, having said that, there are certain things that you can add and people that are, I think we are coming close to finishing up, right? We are coming up to our finishing point. Why don't I, I just wrap this thing and then, and then we will stop. Um, so the, those sitting in ivory tower will say the gold standard is simultaneous stereo camera. The simultaneous stereo camera is not available for sale. And if you have a regular camera and you take two pictures and you create a stereo picture like this, it's still very useful clinically but don't expect it to identify progression that accurately because depending on how you move the joystick, you may be completely wrong. And you are still have to do the CD ratio analysis. You still have to do rim analysis, which is, a, is not easily done by practitioners. And Panak, you, and you have about, you know, you have about seven to nine minutes. So, it's, you know. Oh, we got seven to nine minutes. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. good. You're going about, you're going to go to about 50. So nine, so nine you just 50. tell me when to stop and I'll happily okay. stop at that time. Just go, okay. to, just go about 50-ish, 51. All right. Okay. Good. So here is, you have, you know, when you have a, a patient that has uh, some level of damage, we argue that the, is the gam macula affecting, getting affected first? Is it the optic nerve head or is it the nerve fiber layer? And the reality of the answer is glaucoma is a pretty heterogeneous disease. And if the pressure is the fundamental cause of the problem and the valerian degeneration is the way that you explain the death of the retinal ganglion cell axon, all parts of the retina are free game. It can actually get damaged in the macula. It can be around the optic nerve head. It can be the it can be on the optic nerve head, damage can be visible, or it can be nerve fiber layer. All these regions can show damage. If you so so most of the time, nerve fiber layer beats uh, the uh, ganglion cell complex. 
but occasionally you find ganglion cell complex being obvious in damage. The uh, GCC that has been trademarked by OptiView, there are similar version to this available in almost all OCTs. And so you can measure the macular region in uh, any of your OCT and get some data. Where progression is concerned, consensus is limited. And we don't know the exact definition of progression. If you even agreed on it, you will have a real hard time convincing people that a person has progressed. One of the ways to actually identify progression is event analysis. Event analysis is if a particular location shows repeatable five micron damage, meaning you do it once and you say, hmm, this region has gone thinner and it's gone down by about five to six microns, then you can say that damage is probably real. Let me repeat the scan. And if it's probably there, then this is a cross-sectional way of saying there is progression. You could have a, 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 tr a trend analysis, which is more accurate. So you can do trend analysis of multiple scans, follow up over time and see how much microns goes down in a year. Progression can occur uh, rapidly. If it's occurring rapidly in months, so chances are that in it's no major IOP spike, it's not glaucoma uh, generally, and something else is going on. If you see a lot of pallor, then perhaps consider neurological testing for your patient uh, to, to make sure that it's not a neurological disease other than glaucoma. And of course, if you are convinced that there is a it is glaucoma, then perhaps doing six scans in two years will put the dots close enough that you can actually identify slower progressors much more readily. Now, there is insurance ramifications to this, and so not all of your scans are getting paid, um, but it will at least give you the data to identify if this person's really progressing or not. So six scan in two years, it helps determine progressing patients if it's really glaucoma or not. It can identify the rate of progression with greater accuracy, and it's much more accurate than once or twice per year, and you can identify fast progressors versus slow progressors in glaucomatous cases um, and determine if your treatment is indeed correct. Now, I will wrap today's lecture with myopia and glaucoma, which is a common comorbidity that we actually do see in all our patients. We have myopic eye, and we are wondering, is this myopia or is it glaucoma? And it's actually much more complicated when, you, when the glaucoma diagnosis becomes much more complicated when you have a patient with relatively higher myopia. It doesn't have to be always six diopters or greater. So about 2050, uh, we'll have 5 billion people that will have myopia, uh, which is about half the population. And about one third of these myopes will have six diopters or greater, putting a lot of burden on the healthcare system to identify glaucoma in these cases is going to be a nightmare and already is a nightmare. Now, I loaned this slide from Dr. Linda Zangwill, and Dr. Zangwill has done elegant work to show the issues related to myopia, and nothing that is that we have not thought about in past. You know, when we look at an optic nerve head visually, here as the green dots right here would show where you, where you would say the nerve is clinically, whereas if you use the Brooks uh, membrane opening as your, as your landmark, and you adjust that throughout the OCT, you would get a very different kind of a, a picture of the optic nerve. So your clinical optic nerve may be different than your OCT's optic nerve that we are getting. And this may be a, uh, a real problem in myopes. We might think that, okay, let's just use that landmark. And it's okay that, you know, we can, in healthy patients, you can identify Brooks membrane opening quite easily, even if the axial length is not much more, much different, you can see the glaucoma patient, the Brooks membrane is, becomes a question because it might not obviously be easily uh, identified. You have peripapillary atrophy also throwing a monkey wrench into your, into your identifications. And what you find is that in these patients, um, macular, macular analysis might be a better idea when compared to disc analysis of, of your patient. However, myopia can also cause visual field damage on its own, as well as myopic maculopathy is indeed present in these patients if they have severe enough myopia. So in patients that you're sure that they do not have myopic maculopathy or their myopia is not too bad, 
then you could actually use ganglion cell complex analysis to for your patient, and you may get better outcomes in terms of monitoring or diagnosis. But in cases that you already have uh, damage to the macula, the, then we cannot use OCT-related techniques. The problems are multifold. None of the OCTs, none of the OCTs have yet accounted for axial length-related magnification issues to, to the true values of nerve fiber layer. Um, if a disc analysis is off, uh, given the tilted appearance or a myopic uh, stretched disc, that is a scary looking disc, but may not be glaucoma. And Brooks membrane opening is displaced. And what we consider clinically, the optic nerve head margin may not be an optic nerve head edge as per OCT. Nerve fiber layer can be utilized in patients that don't have dramatic peripapillary atrophy. But if you have a very large peripapillary atrophy or the nerve head is just messed up, then you may use the macula, which is a bit more sensitive. But macula can also be pathological and visual field defects can be related to myopia itself. And you may not see progression or you might see progression. It just becomes an extremely tough situation to handle. So with that- So Panakin, with that being said, um, can you, since you've had all these instruments in your practice, Maybe just explain the normative database, the biggest normative database in any of these instruments, and what was the range of this normative database in hyperopia to myopia so that when our attendees here are scanning a, um, a patient with myopia, maybe how that could be falling out, this normative database. Can you just kind of touch on that a little bit? Absolutely. I've got to, I've got to give you three points. One, statistical fallacy. Second thing is the database and the size of the database. Three things, okay? So remind me about all three things because they are all crucial. Okay. So let's start with hyperopic database, hyperopic patient eyes in these database and actually do devices publish their databases. So to my knowledge, very few devices have truly published their databases. The original uh, OCT published their database. Topcon Maestro, which I was involved with, published their database. Everybody else seems to be keeping it quiet. Okay. So we mm -hmm. don't have good publications telling you what their databases range was. It's a hidden little secret. Now, having been involved in it, I can tell you, we don't have nearly enough the hyperopes that we want, that we would like. The criteria is age related and it's not related to myopia or hyperopia. So anybody can enter into the population so long as they fit the range of hyperopia and myopia that range that you are allowed to. Uh, certainly not anybody greater than four diopters. Most people chop it off. And, you know, six diopters also, you, you know, they chop off as not allowed. So it's four to six plus four to minus six is usually the range that's allowed. So you don't have a lot of high myopes. You don't have that at all. The age is the major criteria that is uh, utilized. Now, most OCTs have around... 350 to 450 sample size. Now you might look at a OCT that has 450 sample size or okay, one more, I'm sorry, iView had 500, I think. Uh, so you look at this and say, all right, 500 is better than 350. And the problem is that is a statistical fallacy or a fool's, um, fool's errand? No, that's a wrong word. It, it, it's a very, it's very misleading. Let's just leave, uh, keep it a little. It's very misleading because 350 to 500 does not make a significant effect on statistics. If you have a sample size of 350 and you want a significant effect on the study outcome, you need to square the population. So 350 square is what is really needed to get a meaningful impact on the study's outcome. 350 to 500, it's the same. It makes our little hearts feel better but that is not really uh, a point. Did I yeah, miss so anything? It's like, it's like going to the beach, Panakin, and I and I took 10 buckets of sand, but I uh, I filled up another 10 buckets of sand. Wow, that's double, but there's still a lot more sand on the beach. So Absolutely. <laughs> and you will never get around to it. The bigger problem is we are not getting ethnic specific database. If you look at, if you remember, those of us who have practiced long enough know that Heidelberg retina tomograph had ethnic specific database and that made a difference in my own eye 
if you put a Caucasian in the selection, it would show you glaucoma. Whereas if you just selected Asian Indian, it would show normal. So if we need ethnic specific database and until that arrives, we really are not going to be getting going much further. Yeah, so a lot of the times the way these the the way this stuff can 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 shake out is using the same instrument over and over again, inducing the same error. And like you said, doing those six and ten, then you can start checking for the progression because that same error should be in there. So that would be my sure. kind of comment. Sure. So. At any rate, um I, I, I think we're out of time, but I want to quickly say here, here's my email and phone number. I still answer my phone calls. It's my office direct line number. It may take me a little bit longer to get back to you, but I always get back. You write an email, I'm always happy, always happy to answer any questions. So with that, Greg and Joe, back to you. Yeah. I'm gonna give everyone a little bit of time to capture your uh uh your 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 information there before I share the slides. But Joe, please make some comments. I thought that was I thought that was a great, very high level uh, discussion of all the topics. Uh, it's very impressive that you're that you have such a command and and a good a breadth of opinions on everything. I thought this was a a great uh, great uh, glaucoma talk. I really enjoyed it. So Thank with you. that being. With that being said, if you take a look at the chat box there, Panakin, you're getting your virtual round of applause. Great information. Thank you. Very interesting. So with that being said, it looks like all the questions were answered. I'm going to say thank you. And this will wrap up decision making in glaucoma. Mm -hmm. This was a virtual uh, uh, course, synchronous virtual course. And thank you, uh, Panakin, for being here and giving this great information. Thank you.